Okay, let's begin. Uh, you want to share sc uh, screen? Nanda, yeah. Uh, Nanda, if you can share screen. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No. All right. Uh, one second, let me switch on my video. How do I do it? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, greetings everyone. Uh, I am Saurav, an academic researcher at the University of Melbourne. And we are in the second week of uh, is Diabetes uh, Symposium. And this is the first session of the Data Analytics Workshop. Uh, this workshop is organized uh, as four sessions on Thursdays of every week from 5 to 7 p.m. and is being supported by IEEE Victorian section mm -hmm. and the Student Engagement Grant Program at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Nanda Kishore, uh, another uh, uh, um, um, academic researcher at the University of Melbourne is the workshop chair for today. And we will be handling uh, all, all alternative uh, sessions. Uh, before we discuss further, uh, let me give you my belated wish for the IEEE day. Um, so IEEE day is celebrated on the first uh, Tuesday of October, which was the day before uh, yesterday. Uh, so this is the uh, IEEE week and uh, all the IEEE volunteers are, and enthusiasts uh, around there. Uh, so now we have we engraved in its essence, uh, the IEEE day's theme is uh, leveraging uh, technology for a better uh, tomorrow. So that's all about uh, IEEE day and let's begin with the workshop. So I'm handing over the session to Nanda. Thanks, Arav. I guess, uh, shall we start, Noor? Yeah, yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay. Hi, Can everyone. You... Sorry? Sorry to interrupt. Can you please keep your mic closer? I think. Oh, okay. Uh, is it, am I not uh, audible clearly? Yeah, I think you are better now. Yeah, yeah. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay. Just... This one, yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, as Saurav introduced, uh, I'm Nanda Kishore. Uh, I just recently finished my PhD from University of Melbourne. Um, so this is a collaborative event between the IEEE organization and uh, also supported by the student grants uh, from University of Melbourne. So we'll be conducting it as a series of four workshops uh, split into uh, two hour sessions every Thursdays from four to uh, from five to seven. So uh, every Thursday is from five to seven Australian time, of course. Uh, so without much uh, delay in that, let's get started uh, with the workshop outline. So we have uh, sort of, this is a very approximate outline. Uh, there, there will be changes as we go forward, depending on the feedback that we receive from you. Uh, so be, today we'll be starting with fundamentals of data handling. Uh, when I say fundamentals, uh, especially what sort of uh, tools you need for analyzing the data and how to handle the data. So which means one of the important tool is a programming tool uh, for which we will be using Python. So today, mostly I'll be introducing you to Python and uh, sort of how Python works, what are the salient features of Python, uh, how do you write some basic codes using Python, and what are the simple data structures. Uh, before we move on to second session, where uh, we will be discussing essential libraries, uh, Python-based libraries that are important for data science. So if you want to analyze any of the uh, data sets or for any application, if you want to perform some data analysis, what are some of the important libraries? Like you might have heard of libraries like NumPy or uh, Skipy or Matplotlib for visualization purposes, or maybe a scikit-learn, which is mainly a machine learning based library, or it might be a Pandas, which, is got, uh, which has got a uh, lot of efficient um, data structure, uh, data science handling capabilities. So we'll be introducing that in session two. Before we move on to uh, some preliminary data analysis and uh, 
how sort of data pre-processing, all those things in session three, ending with a moderate level, a mini project sort of thing in session four on a time series data set. So as you can see in the name, so time series data set is something like where you have some sort of data captured over a period of time. So any sort of quantity that is captured over a period of time. So how do you analyze that and sort of analyze the trajectory with respect to time, those sort of things. So today is session one, um, fundamentals of data handling. So where I'll be discussing these uh, four key things. So what is data analysis? Just a brief, very brief uh, introduction into the world of data analytics analysis. And then why do we use Python uh, compared to other programming languages? Python data types, and finally Python data structures. Now, before we move forward, uh, so because this is first session and I understand we have a sort of audience from a diverse um, background. So we are just uh, trying to keep it as simple as possible. So it might uh, come off as a little slow or very uh, too little content for this particular workshop. But uh, it, because of that also, uh, we are also floating a sort of Zoom poll, just getting feedback from you regarding the understanding that you have, the skill set that you have in Python, just whether you have uh, you know about Python beforehand, or is it something that uh, you are uh, you want to study now, or do you have some moderate understanding? So feel free to interrupt me at any time and give me your feedback, so that in the coming session we can go faster or slower depending on uh, how we require. So what is data analysis? So it's so data analysis is just it's just a process of uh, systematically applying uh, your statistical or logical techniques so to describe and illustrate and condense and recap and evaluate data so it's it's just like you will have a lot of data so especially with the evolution of internet there is just like an explosion of data you see data everywhere like every single aspect of life uh, be it like how Google gathers data from us or in social media. I mean, every single aspect from your grocery shopping to your health, to your just standard shopping things or it, uh, to your sleep, uh, sleep patterns. It might be any single aspect of your life. There is some data associated with that. So when I say data analysis, what it means is that just structuring that data properly, like for example, say you want to analyze sleep patterns. So there are a lot of, say, nowadays you have got uh, variable devices and things like that, where you gather data from someone's, like put a variable device and gather data from the person's sleep patterns, and then try to analyze what's, what are the sleep patterns, and then say, say whether there is any correlation between that sort of different sleep patterns or some abnormal sleep pattern and some sort of diseases or some disorders. So there is, there is just no end to anything, uh, there is just no uh, limit to the imagination. Uh, so when I say data analysis, so you just gather all of this data and then just sort of try to structure it properly so that you get some useful insights out of it. It might be just like a big pile of uh, sort of thing uh, where you have to structure it properly so that out of that data, you get some very important insights that you use to make it might to make it might be your goal might be anything so your goal might be that you just want to understand what is present in the data so that in future you can gather better type better sort of data or it might be that using that data you want to make some predictive information like predict something or you want to model some sort of phenomenon that explains some physical process in real world so it there is again there is no limit and there is absolutely no single area where data analysis does not find its application. So it helps you discover useful patterns and information. Uh, and of course, assist in predicting unknown or future information. So as I said, if you want to sort of give keywords to those sort of analysis that I mentioned, so it might be like a descriptive analysis where you just want to describe a particular data through some important measures, or it might be diagnostic so you want to understand what happened or like some phenomenon. It might be uh, 
health scenario or it might be anything it might be predicting an election outcome whatever it is so which means it predictive would be in all obviously you would have come across a lot of these election predictions or say um, yeah i mean weather predictions that, i mean the, it, again predictive modeling is something that is there in again every aspect of life uh, and so there are different aspects to data analysis and it has got a wide range of applications from healthcare to internet to smart city so like uh, healthcare is where like you have got uh, wearable devices for example your sleep patterns like i like how i mentioned earlier um then there are like works where uh, you know uh, there is one recent work where they try to predict influenza outbreak from um, wearable devices so how uh, what's your what's your activity level and gathering those sort of information they try to predict the influenza outbreak which they were all they, which the they were also repurposing for a uh, similar tracking in covid-19 sort of cases uh, in scenario uh, then you have got uh, smart city so which is i mean which is sort of the buzzword nowadays so uh, where governments anywhere in the world announce okay we will make this xyz smart city so where a uh, lot of small processes or lot of small like it might be some work with the local city corporation or things like that that will be automated or it might be some sort of energy monitoring where you will have smart energy monitoring that optimizes your energy usage or it might be a transport where uh like you have with uber and other uh, shared taxis and things like that so it's probably easier to list an area that does not use data analysis rather than listing the areas that use data analysis so uh this is a pretty standard pipeline uh for a data analysis sort of framework or approach where there is actually two important stages one is you acquire the data so like uh, for example again if we go back to the sleep pattern example so we have the variable so you put the watch on the person's wrist and then gather the data so that is the first step uh, where you acquire the data then the second stage is the analyze that data so you can see here there are two which is data wrangling and data processing so data wrangling is more like just cleaning up the data and structuring it and sort of thing then data processing would be final uh, analysis and processing that you would do so as i as as you can see here next to data acquisition there are different types of data like it might be a one dimensional data or depending on the dimensions so like it might be a one dimensional data for example a ecg curve so it's got just say an amplitude that varies with respect to time so you just have one dimension so there is just one quantity that varies with respect to time so that is a time series curve so it's a one dimensional data so then you have got image data so which is basically two dimensional data so we have got a x dimension as well as a y dimension uh, with respect to x and y the value varies so you got so it might be very any natural images or it might be your uh, x ray medical images it might be ct medical images then you have got 3d data which is like for example volumetric images like in case of some medical image scans you have got x y and also along z direction so it's more like a volume of image or it might be a video where your x and y dimension will be your image dimension and the third dimension will be that of time the because video is essentially that, that image with changing with respect to time so depending on so each of these datas have their own advantages and disadvantages so the multi dimensional datas capture different variations but then they are little harder to process in the sense that they require more computational power although computational power is not a big deal nowadays because you have got a lot of graphics cards and super performance computers so it's, it's very much easier but yeah every for, but like for example with but that would require little little more time so for example with 1d data like the sleep performance uh, thing that i told so those watches itself will have many algorithms and sophisticated data analysis approaches locally that like th those things will be done locally and will give you newer insights now this sort of local processing is also possible because you have got uh, sort of 
simpler data and sophisticated algorithms. So there is a whole lot of um, uh, dimensions to this data analysis problem. So there is one key aspect of data acquisition and one key aspect of data processing. So we will, of course, ignore the data acquisition part for this workshop purpose. We will assume, say, we have got data set. So we are only concerned with the other stage, which is data analysis. For the second stage, what we need is the tools, tools that we use to perform data analysis. So like, how do you load the data onto the computer and then analyze that? So for that, you have got a range of tools um, as you might have come across. So it might be Python, it might be R, it might be a Java, or it might be uh, something like a MATLAB. So each of these uh, languages have their own advantages and disadvantages. Like MATLAB is a proprietary based one and Java is basically more useful for web application sorts of um, development. So for example, Python, some of the important features, why do we uh, stick to Python? So one of the important thing is it's a very general purpose, high level programming language. And it's got a syntax that, it, that is pretty much similar to your usual English structure. So you can write your program just like how you would normally write an English sentence. So it's not far off from that. So that sort of gives you a better intuitive understanding of what is happening and how you can uh, sort of, uh, if you have a bigger problem, how we can split that problem into smaller chunks and then write your programs to sort of uh, solve those particular smaller objectives. So it provides a powerful environment for scientific computing. Uh, it's much faster and more scalable. And also, of course, you have got a lot of uh, wide range of uh, efficient libraries like NumPy, Skippy, Matplotlib, et cetera. Another important um, thing with Python that you should remember is, is a, it, it, it works with the interpreter. So opposed to say a programming language like C, which mainly works with a compiler, the key difference is when you run a C program, so you, your program has to compile before you can run and decide what sort of error it's there. So whereas Python directly has a, works with the interpreter. So even if say your, you have written 10, 10 lines of Python code and there is an error in 10th line, the nine lines of code will still run until it hits the 10. Opposed to say a C where it has to compile before it can run. That's one of the key difference uh, in Python. So uh, that's what uh, I mentioned. So it's an interpreted programming language. So it basically works with the interpreter as I'm opposed to say a, a C programming language, which works with a compiler. It's got very efficient high level data structures and simple but effective approach to object oriented programming, which I hope uh, most of you would know. So where uh, you de declare classes and inheritance and object oriented programming. Um, other important thing is so it relies on indentation. So Python relies heavily on indentation like when you would uh, define your standard if statements or a for loop, things like that, they need to be properly indented. So this indentation, it relies heavily on indentation. It would not work without that. So the indentation using white spaces so that you define properly the scope, which uh, we will understand as we go through the programs. Uh, and it has got very simple but effective like cross-platform uh, compatible libraries. So it works equally well on your unique systems so Windows, Macintosh computers. So um, coming to the practical aspects of it, there are wide variety of um, IDEs that is the development environments for Python uh, and how you install. So I assume most of you have already uh, Python installed. Um, most of the computers actually come, uh, will already have Python installed. So there are a lot of IDEs that you could use for uh, developing some simple programs in Python. So one of the popular ones, which, all, which we will also be using is Jupyter Notebook. So which is a open source web application. So it allows you to create like, your, you, can, you, can even, uh, you can write your codes, test small snippets of codes. Uh, you can even write your uh, 
equations that you might be implementing or like properly comment. So it sort of acts or you can create a Jupyter notebook as an independent or a standalone document that describes whatever theory things you might have, like a, some particular description about the data that you are analyzing or some particular uh, type of math equation that you are implementing as well as your code. So all of those things can be put together and you can sort of create it like a standalone thing. Then you have got Anaconda, so which is a free and open source distribution of uh, Python. Then there are um, then there are PyCharm, Spider, and Visual Studio Code, which are also some of, um, some of the standard IDEs. Then there is a next generation of a web-based interface, a continuation of Jupyter Notebook, which is Jupyter Lab. So which is more like an internet-based one. So where you don't even have to install, you can either install Jupyter Lab or you can just go to the Jupyter Lab website and just um, click on the link and get started there. Uh, so I'll use Jupyter Lab for the rest of this session to just do, demonstrate simple things about the uh, Python data structures. Uh, it would be really useful if you can, if you have a Jupyter uh, this thing installed. Uh, I can uh, help you if you have any doubts. You can just go to Jupyter, Google Jupyter Lab and access that as well. So uh, some of the fundamentals that some of the fundamentals that we will discuss today uh, include these things. So one is data types. So first of all, you should know how you represent in your data in a particular programming language, right? So like the data that you would be analyzing might be a numeric data. So it might be like a number or it might be some sort of uh, string, like a text data, like you want to analyze a text document. So how do you actually represent that particular data in Python? So that is generally the most basic thing before you begin with any other advanced analysis. So what are the data types that you have in Python? Then next come the data structures. So which is how do you, so, okay, so data types are like what sort of, what types of data we can have in Python. Data structures are like containers which hold these datas. Like you might have a, for example, a table of data. Now, how do you put this table in a Python program? Or you might have one page of a document. How do you represent this entire page in a Python program so that you can then further analyze? So these are because once you map from a particular page to a data structure or say from a particular table to a data structure, those things are important because then it's just purely you are inside the Python. It doesn't matter where your data came from. Then you have got control statements, which are the important things in every any programming language which is the, the, your standard if and else statements, which basically control the flow of programs. Like if this is the condition, then execute this set of programs. If not, then execute the other set of codes. Then you have the loops, uh, which is again, just iterating over, uh, iterating for different, uh, for a fixed number of times, just the loops and iterations. Then functions. So which is another important aspect in any programming language, which helps you create uh, program modules. Like you can break down your big program into smaller sub functions, sub modules, and then create individual functions so that it is easier for you to analyze. It is easier for you to structure the code. It is easier for you to debug that uh, and also make it like more generic. Like if you, uh, for example, say for addition, if you just create a generate uh, function that takes X and Y as input and returns the sum, then that works for any X and Y. So these are some five key things that we will be discussing uh, today. This is by no means exhaustive. There are quite few other things like inherit concept of inheritance or even classes, objects, many other things. Uh, but uh, we will be just, we'll be discussing only those things that are relevant to our data analysis things. And if necessary, if we find necessary as we go forward, then we'll again incorporate any other things needed and discuss them again. Uh, let me 
open my Jupyter notebook. Uh, so let's start with Python data types. So Python data types. So as I said, it's data type. When I say data types, obviously it's just like, how do you represent your data? So what sort of data would you have? Like it might be a numeric data or it might be like a text document. So there are basically mainly these sort of doc, uh, data types in Python. So numeric, you have one, then you have got the string data type. Then you have got the Boolean data type. So numeric is the numbers. How do you represent your numbers in Python? Then string is how do you represent a text in Python? Then you have got booleans, which is binary value. So which is true or false. So how do you represent that in Python? So for example, let's say numeric data type. So when I say numeric data type, um, as you would know with numbers, so you have different types of numbers like your number might be an integer or it might be a float or it might be a complex number. So if you want to say, so you might have something like this. So where X is equal to 10. So as you can see 10, it's an integer. So, and you have got um, print. This is uh, print type of X. So that would give you the uh, data type of X and then you want to print X. So if you run this cell, you can do use shift enter so for so if you run this cell, that would give you the class of this is int. So x is basically an integer and x is equal to 10. So it's printing 10, that is for integer. Then if, for example, you have y, which is 1.1, and if you uh, print the data type and print the value, so that would be a float. So which prints, 10, uh, uh, yeah, so which prints 1.1, 1 .1, uh, so that would be float. Then you have got, uh, yeah, these are all, yeah. So then you have got uh, z equals one plus two j. So which is a complex number. Uh, so if you print this, then it will print complex one plus two j. So yeah, this is a wrong comment. So it should print one plus two j and this will print 1.1. So you can see here, so we have got three types of numbers here. So one is an integer, one is a float, another is a complex. You can also do these basic uh, arithmetic operations. So we should be just say print X plus two, X minus three, X multiplied by one. Then this double star, double asterisk would represent power. So X to the power of two, which would be X squared. So that is another simple thing. Then you have got um, say X plus equal to one. So which is nothing but X is equals to X plus one. It's more like an accumulator. Uh, so if you print X, uh, that would give you, uh, yeah. So that would be, that would be say 11. So then same thing with multiplication as well. So as you can see here, so this is just very simple example. So the, of the numeric data type that we would use in Python. Then we have got the Boolean data types. So which is very standard. So you have got uh, say true and False. These are the two important keywords that you have. Um, so these are the reserved keywords. So which means you can't use say you can't define a variable named true because this is a standard keyword that's reserved in Python. So uh, true represents the state of say one, and false represents say the state of zero. So if you want to just print type of t that represents a class known as bool, which is boolean number. So this is an operator, for example, that compares whether T and F are equal. So, so it, it prints two because it, it, it is, it compares not equal. So whether T, if T is not equal to F, so if I had written this, then it represents false because here I'm comparing whether T and F are equal and they are not equal. So it, it is printing false. So if my question would be, whether print T and F are not equal, then it would print true because they are not equal. So that is Boolean data type. Then we have got uh, strings. So 
uh, you can use single quotes or double quotes for strings in Python. So for example, say we have got a string, uh, say hello. So which is assigned to this variable hello. So if you want to print this, then it will print uh, hello. That's one string. Uh, and len is an operator which you can use to get the length of the string. So if you print len of hello, that will print five, which is the length of the string that we have. Then if you want to access the strings, say for example, you have got this string here. Now, if you want to access the particular character from this, this, then you can use it through indexing. So for example, print hello of one. So within square brackets, hello of one. So Python indexing starts with zero. So zero corresponds to H. So one will give you E. Then if you want to access a range of indices, then you can say print hello of one to three. So which would print EL. So which is EL, zero, one, two, three. So one and two. So the always should remember another thing. So when you say one to three, so when you write a lower index to upper index, so upper index is always exclusive and the lower one is always inclusive. So here one to three you have. So one is you have E, uh, then it will print L, which is two, but it won't print the other L, which is three because it is exclusive. So when you say one to three, what it prints is the first one, uh, the index at one and the index at two. That's uh, other way. Then another popular uh, thing uh, that uh, you can use with Python is negative indexing. So which is sort of uh, reverse indexing. So for example, before this range indexing, let me write uh, another line here. Yeah. So uh, if I just say print hello of minus one, it will print O, which is the same as printing. If I want to print, print four, there are five characters here. So which means four is the last one. So if I print four, hello of four, that will also print the same thing. So negative indexing is nothing but you just do the reverse. So our other simpler way would be to the negative indexing, you just add the length of the string to get the actual indexing. So minus one, then you add the string plus five. So that would give you four. So which is what you're getting. Negative indexing is also very useful, uh, especially when you have, uh, when you want to do sort of some descending order sorting and other things. So in some programs, negative indexing is a very useful thing to have. So similarly, for example, here you have minus three to minus one range indices, right? So if you add five, this would be two to four. So it means it should print the ones at two and three. So which is L and L. That is how you would access strings. Uh, you just have a basic string variable. So which we have access now using a single index or a range of indexes and then negative indexing. Then let's say you have two strings. So which is one is say hello and another is word. So how do you concatenate the strings? So the string concatenation you can do using a simple plus operator. So you can see here. So if you do this, oh sorry, I had to click this. So you have this, then you have hello world. This is just for, so for example, even if you remove this space, so, you, so, so if you want to have just this, so hello world. So you just, you can just use a simple plus operator to concatenate both the strings. So here, if you want, for example, if you want any other separator, you can add the separator here. Say within quotes, you add comma, then you add a here. So it would be hello comma world. So you want to add hyphen, you can add hello hyphen world. So you can add any separator that you want and then print it here. And this is some sort of uh, print uh, form. Uh, if you want to print it in a particular format, like how you would have in, uh, say, uh, your standard C language. So, percent s, percent s, uh, percent d. So d is for integer. S is for uh, string. So you get it. Hello world, one two. So this string, this string, and this one. Uh, you can also specify here percent f, and then how many digits you want to have. F is for float, and how many, uh, like if if you want to have two precision, like a 2.53 or three precisions, 2.536, things like that. So this is a very simple string concatenation. Another thing with strings in Python uh, is you also have some inbuilt methods with the strings. 
that you can use. Like if you want to capitalize a certain string or like, for example, say you have this, yes is equals to H-E-L-L-O, hello. So if you want to just capitalize the first word, so yes dot capitalize, you just write that. So it will give you hello, this. Then if you want to make all the characters uh, upper, then it would be S dot upper. That's one string method. Then if you want to say this is our just uh, right justification, that is print it right justify, like how you would have in your Word document, left justification, right justification, those sort of things. So this would be right justification, say this would be center, and this would be, yeah, this would be, uh, okay, yeah, I don't have the left one there. Yeah, so uh, this this is uh, print s dot replace. So which, which is replacing the strings. So for example, here you have got s, which is a string. So yes dot replace, replace L with ELL. -L. So wherever you find L in your original string S, replace all the occurrences of L with ELL. -L. So you have got H E L L O. So in place of L, you are replacing it with ELL -L, and of course the parentheses as well, whatever is there within this quotes. So you can see here H E, then you have got ELL, -L, then again ELL, -L, then O. So that is uh, string replace method. Uh, then this, for example, uh, s dot strip would uh, strip the uh, leading white spaces. So, for example, here you have got extra white space here uh, before the world. So, if you want to just get rid of the white space, then you can just read s dot strip so that that would get rid of the white space. Uh, so, this is just three basic data types. Uh, one is numeric, where you have got integers, floats, and complex numbers. Then you have got the strings where you represent the text documents and things like that. And then you have got the Boolean data type. So which is which represents the binary straight binary state. Then you have also uh, uh, something known as casting. So where you actually can convert one data from one type to another. Like for example, you want to, uh, so you have got, uh, you instead of just declaring the x equal to 10, you declare it x equal to int of 10. So which means your x will be explicitly, you have to make sure that x is 10. So for example, you have got y equal to 2.3. So you, you want to say z, which is int of y. So if you print it here, so it prints 2.3. Now you can see first it prints float, then it prints 2 because when it converts 2.3 to 2, it's obviously running, uh, truncating it. So you're getting 2. Uh, from 2 point to the nearest integer is 2 and now the class is int. So explicitly you can convert the data types from one to another as well. Then yeah, so that then if you want to create a string out of a number, so for example you have got 10 here, then you just write str, str of 10, it would give you this, so which would be uh, 10 is your string and uh, the class is str. So three basic data types and ways to convert within them from one data type to another. Then you have got operators. So which is basically, a, which I discussed earlier, like arithmetic operators, the addition, subtractions, and then the logical operators. So when, say for example, you have two different conditions, so you'll have and or not. So you want to combine two conditions or you want to have those sort of things. Then you've got comparison operators, which I showed earlier. So equals, not equals, then the greater, less than, all equals. Then if we come to control statements, uh, if, this is how you would write a if else statement. So for example, x equals to one, y equals to two. If x less than y, followed by a colon. So this is what I was referring to when I said Python follows indentation. So you can see here, so this sentence, sentence so it comes here. So there's one tab, so one tab indentation here. So you can have any sort of one tab, two tabs, whatever it is, but you have to follow a uniform indentation style within that program. Like your editors or IDs, whatever you're using, they would sort of give you, normally give you the options to figure out your indentation. You can change that, but whatever indentation you do, you have to stick to that particular style of indentation within that particular program. Otherwise it will mess up the entire scope leading to other errors. Sometimes it may not even generate explicit errors. It may actually, uh, I have had cases where like you have big programs and then because of some scope issues, 
uh, it's sort of gives you weird outputs, so it's, which becomes pretty hard to debug. So you have got this simple if else statement. Uh, so you have got this comparison operator. Uh, then you have got this, uh, which I said, logical and. So for example, x equals to three, y equals to two, that equal to 0 0.5. If x is greater than y and y is greater than z, then print this, else none. So this is a logical way of combining two different conditions. So you could have and or, so that's, you can see here x is greater than y and y is in turn greater than z. So that's one thing. Then, uh, yeah, then again, using the R, you could also have uh, nested if else statements. So where uh, instead of else, you could have say something like ELIF. So it should give you else if, and again, you have say a condition here, say Y less than Z, something like that. Then you end up with here. So again, else here, else here, and then again print. This would be more like a nested if else statement. So this is just a basic uh, overview of how you would write. So as in when we encounter some programs, we'll again give more details. So this is a basic way of writing control statements. Then finally, you have the functions. So which is uh, what I mentioned earlier. So where you have to sort of modularize your programs and things like that. So for example, def is the keyword that you write use to define a function. Uh, so you have got this function. So say def hello world that takes input argument a number and does number equals number plus two, right? And returns a, returns the number. So this is a function that you are defined. So def is a keyword, hello world is your function name, number is your input argument. Then inside that you do number equals to number plus two and return the number. So say for example, number one equals to two, then you do hello world of number one equals to number two. So if you print that, Oh yeah, I didn't define that. So you run this, then run this. So you'll have two and four. So which is you are sending two and then you're getting two plus two, which is four. Another popular way to um, define these functions, write them is something known as uh, Lambda. So, which, uh, so this is very useful concept. The same function, we can write it in a more compact way and this is especially useful when we are writing some bigger problems uh, programs. And uh, I, I'll, uh, we have got one or two examples where I can demonstrate. I'll demonstrate that. So, for example, this entire function we can write like this, like this three lines. That's it. So instead of having uh, instead of having two cells like this, so you see here we have got a function hello world, which takes the input argument number and it does number equal number plus two and returns number. So instead what, so you have the keyword Lambda, which takes the argument number and returns number plus two. This is known as hello world, right? So and all, so this is in one line, you are defining this entire function. Then inside this hello world, you are passing the number two. So it gives the exact same output. So this one line is defined entire this thing. So only thing is in, so this is the format. So you have got the keyword uh, Lambda so where you have got the input arguments and this is the expression. So you need to have, the only thing here is that when you want to write it in terms of this format, you need to have one single expression. So entire function of yours has to be sort of boiled down to one compact expression. And that expression, you just put it here. And this is your input argument. And whatever the expression is there, it will return you the result. So this one line defines your entire program. So that is a very basic introduction uh, to Python data types. What the numeric integer and string data type that we have and how do we write functions uh, and control statements and basic operators. So before we move on to second part, which discusses Python data structures, uh, if uh, you have any doubts, Uh, someone raised the hand. Just give me a moment. I'll unmute them. Yes, Daniel, please go ahead. Oh, you're unmute. Would you please unmute yourself? Yeah. 
I have a question. Uh, yeah. Is the programming for the Python similar to the Java? Because uh, I've already seen all these things in the Java as well. Uh, come again, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. I'm saying that is it similar to the Java program? Yeah, there are some things that are similar. Some some of the syntax are different, but some of the things essentially it's. I mean, yeah, some of the concepts are similar. Yeah, there are some differences, key differences. Though, as we move forward, we'll discuss that further. Uh, so there is another question by Vincent. What program should we be installing? Uh, yeah. So uh, you have to. Uh, I, I I assume you already have Python installed. So if not, install. Python in your computer. So before that, even you can just, uh, uh, you can actually just, uh, how do I access Q and A? Um, oh yes. Yeah, so you just have to install Python and then uh, normally most of the computers, especially the newer ones, you uh, you come with Python pre-installed. Uh, if not, you can just directly go to Python's website and install the Python. So it might be Python. Python 2 is slightly outdated now. So you can install Python 3, which is, which is newer version is 3.6 or 3.7. And then you can use, uh, without installing anything, like I said, you can just Google Jupyter Lab. Uh, this is what I'm using here. So you can just get started with the Jupyter Lab without installing anything. You can just write simple programs. Then you also have got uh, Google uh, Notebooks nowadays. So which is again, very easy to uh, write your programs. So yeah. uh, just to add to that, thank you. I have just added the links of what you have mentioned uh, in yeah. the uh, chat session. Yeah. Okay. 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 So would you mind just adding the link to the Jupyter lab? I think I missed it in the Okay, chat. okay, I'll add it. Okay. And that would, thank you. And there is another question. Can you please explain Lambda part again? I okay. think- um, uh, session one. So that's, it's pretty simple. So you can see here, this is how your Lambda function would look like. So you have got the keyword Lambda that you write, right? Arguments, expression. So here, the, like function, what is the format for a function here in the standard format? So this number is nothing but an argument, right? So def is the keyword, hello world is the function name. And this number is your argument, which is which you are passing to the function. So same thing here. So Lambda, arguments, expression. So this is the input argument that you are passing and expression is that expression uses your input argument and returns you the final value. Like for example, in our case, the expression is X plus two. So number, number plus two. So number is your input argument. You are passing this input number and the function does number plus two and returns you that, returns you that. So this is the whole Lambda, this thing. So it is assigned to hello world. So when I say hello world of number one, so number one is nothing but two. So hello world of two, when I do, so what it does is it passes two here. So two becomes two plus two, four, and it returns to four. So this is a very compact way to represent, especially when you have one single expression. Uh, we will uh, explore that in some later bit, bit complicated pro uh, problems, how it is uh, very useful. Moving on to part two. Um, so some of the built-in containers, so we'll explore some of the important data structures and built-in containers in Python. So there are basically four important data structures or containers that we use in Python. One is a list, another is a set, another is a tuple, and finally a dictionary. So these are four key data structures that we hold, that we use to hold the data. Now each has their own advantage and disadvantage. Um, so let's start with list. So list, so how you would have an array, like in a C program, all right? Like when you define an array of say size 10, like when, you, like uh, that means you have a vector of 10 values, 20 values. So, so list is pretty much similar to that. You can have one single list of 10 values, or you can have a list inside the list. So a list is something like this, something like this that you, uh, that you would normally, um, that you would normally define using square brackets. So square brackets are something that uh, you would normally use to define uh, the print. Uh, so yeah, it should be five and zero. So uh, so you start with a square bracket and end with a square bracket. So this is your list entries. So if I just print this type of the list, so this is class is list, and it prints this list three one two five zero. Now there are three important things here, actually four rather. 
So that I have highlighted in bold here. That is the list is it's an ordered collection. So what I mean is the order in which you insert these elements, it will print like this, like three, one, two, five, zero. It's here three, one, two, five, zero. So you are accessing that order. It's not shuffled or anything. It's whatever order you put it in, you'll access it in that order. Second is changeable. What I mean by changeable um, is, I'll get to it uh, in a different example. Then third is indexed. As in using indexes, you can access the elements of the list. Zeroth index, first index, second index. Then fourth is straightforward, duplicate members. That is, you can have duplicate members. Like you can have a two, two, five, five. So you can have duplicate members. So this is a very standard list example. And again, alien is the operator here as well that you use to determine the length of a list. So if I use alien of XS, that will give you five, which is the number of elements that we have in this list. Now let's first see how do we access the items in this list? Pretty much similar to how we did with strings. So you have got this excess of two, which is nothing but access the third element because the indexing starts at zero. So it prints two. Then the negative indexing. So which, as I said, you count reverse. So we have got length five, five minus one would be four. So it prints the fourth one, which is the last one. So minus one basically means print the last one. So that's the starting index in the reverse direction. So which is again, excess of four. So you can see here, both the things are same. Then you have got excess of two to four. So which means two to four, you get the indexes and four being exclusive. So you, you print the second and third or like the here, this one, two and five. Then you have got this another type of range indexing where you just give the lower index and you don't give the upper index. So when you do this, what it does is inclusive of this. So for example, zero, one, two. So from two here, two, five, zero, print all of them. So two, you are, you are given the lower limit. If you don't give the upper limit, that prints for starting from that index, print the rest of the list. Same thing in the opposite direction. So if you do this, starting from the first index, print only till this. Again, that uh, print only till this means that the previous one only will be printed because it's exclusive. So upper limit is always exclusive in Python. The lower limits are always inclusive. Then the same thing with negative indexing as well. Now I said here, so one is ordered, that was very clear. Second, what I said was changeable. So what I mean by that is you can change the list elements. Like for example, excess is three, one, two, five, zero. Now here, the third index excess of two, instead I assign with some FO. So it changes the list element and now it prints three, one, five, zero. Now you can see this list is a sort of a hybrid list. So as in there is, you, you, you can't lay, say like, uh, it's like, uh, it's the homogeneous thing, like how you have in a array or whatever, like this array, whether it contains integers or this array, whether it contains these floats numbers. So list can contain pretty much any types of data. So you have got three, one, which are numbers. Then you have got this string, then again, numbers. So you can modify the list. Another way is append. So here at a particular index, you inserted this. If you use append, then it will append at the end. So just append at the end. Then you want to assign a smaller list. So for example, you have got this list of list eight, nine here. And so positions two to four. So if you do this, so here three, one, right? Then two and three will be assigned eight and nine. Then again, you have got zero and bar. So indexes, indices two and three, that is the indices two and three, that is the third element and fourth element are to be replaced by eight and nine. So that is how you modify list in this case. Then if you want to do say excess dot pop, so which means just remove the last element, just opposite of what you would do, append is automatically at the end. So pop would be do the same thing. So this is print X and excess. So bar is popped out and this list is remaining. Then remove. So if you want to remove particular element, not just the last one, particular element. So if you want to remove eight, so remove eight. So you end up with three, one, nine, zero. And ultimately you just want to 
delete the list from your memory. So you just use the DEL keyword. So del the list and then print. So it will give you an error. Name access is not defined because you already deleted it here. So it's no longer uh, present in the memory. So if you try to print that, it will give you an error. Then if you want to join two lists, like how you did prints uh, uh, with strings, so exactly the same thing. You have got say a list one, X, Y, Z. Then you have got list two, which is one, two, and three. So if you want to combine the two lists, you have got list one plus list two, that would straight away combine the list. If you want to iterate over a list, like if you, you want to run, run a list, so for example, because ultimately list is what? List is a collection of items. So you've got like three elements in this list, five elements in this list. So you want to go through the individual elements in a loop. So if you want to iterate over that particular list, then you can do it like this. Say for example, you have got a list animals, which has one entry cat, another entry dog, another entry monkey. So you can add for animal in animals, print animal. So if you do this, it will print cat, dog, and monkey. So for animal, in animals. So in is a membership operator. So it just says for every animal present in animals list. So first cat, then dog, then monkey. That's one way to go about it. You can also use some function known as enumerate that will also give you a numbering. For example, if you do this for idx, comma animal in enumerate of animals. So then what it will do is IDX will give you numbers. 0, 1, 2, because your list is of length 3. So to avoid confusion, I'll remove this IDX plus 1. So I'll just, let's just print this. So you've got 0, 1, 2. So for IDX comma animal in enumerate of animals, so that at 0th position in the list, you have a cat. At first position in the list, you have a dog. At second position in the list, you have a monkey. So that's uh, sort of uh, basic uh, uh, concepts of the list, uh, where you have a list, you create a list, uh, you remove elements from the list, you determine the lengths of the list, modify the list, uh, join two lists or loop through a list. So for example, let's do this practice one. Um, for a list X in Python, and a number y. Okay, we have given a number y. Count number of occurrences of y in the list x. So for example, we are given this list. Say x is 3, 1, 4, 22, 5, 4, 10, 4, 100, 4, 30. x is one list. y is 4. How many times does 4 appear in this list? So one here, one here, one here, and one here. So four times the number four appears in this list X. So if we want to uh, do that, so let's write a function for that so that whatever list we pass, we should be able to execute that program. So like how I said, so we have got def, the function name is count Y in X. Let's do that. And the input argument that we are facing is, uh, we are getting is X and Y. X is the list and Y is the number. So it's very simple. Like how would I did here in the loop for val in X, that is take every entry in X. If that entry is equal to Y, then increase your counter. That is count becomes count plus one. Initialize the count to zero. So count this in a loop. So if, if they are equal, so run this definition, then say I use this in X and Y and then count Y in X function, X and Y. So that gives you four, there are four fours. So that is one approach. It's a very simple brute for, um, simple brute force approach. So where you just run, run, run a loop, compare with every single element in the list. If it is equal, then increase the count. Another is your list has an inbuilt operation known as dot count. So that is X is your list and Y is something that you want to count in list. Then all you, can, all you have to do is X dot count of Y. If you do x dot count of y, then what it will do is it will count the number of occurrences of y in x. So run this program, you'll again get four. This is a more standard compact way where you just have a standard function that is available with the Python list. So you just use that x dot count of y, return the count. 
So that is Python lists. Let's move on to tuples. So which is pretty much the same thing. As I said in the um, bold format, so you have got ordered in lists, it was changeable. Now here it is unchangeable. So that's one key difference. Rest are the same. So ordered, indexed, duplicate members. Three properties are same between tuples and the list. The key difference being unchangeable. So you cannot change the entries of the tuple. So for example, and another key difference is in lists, you use square brackets. In tuples, you use parentheses. So same thing. So x equals fruit, wedge, animal. This is a tuple. So class tuple, and it prints like this. So same thing, use the length. You have got length of three. It is indexed as well. So which means you can use the standard indexing that I mentioned. So same negative indexing, all the things are the same. So you have got range indexing, which is pretty much the same. Now changing tuples. So for example, you have got X equals to fruit, wedge, animal. Yeah, fruit again. It, it allows duplicate members. Now let's say like how you read with list, you want to do X of one, you want to analyze it with banana. So you can't do that. It's tuple object does not support item assignment. So you cannot modify tuples. So you can't like you can. So that's one key difference between what you have in a list and what, what you have in tuples. So, but within that, let's see. So instead I declare this. Now this, this worked because here we have a tuple, right? This is one element. This is another element. This is another element. This element inside the tuple is actually a list, right? So which, we, which you can see we have defined using square bracket. So zeroth element in the tuple is fruit. First element is wedge. Second element is a list. Now in that second element, I want to modify the zeroth element. That if I run this, so it worked. And then now if I want to print, you can see that uh, animal has been modified by uh, because this is a list inside a tuple. Whereas if I would do that to the, uh, if, if I did do here, tuple entry that I cannot modify. And if I want to say join tuples, same thing as list. So for example, you have got uh, tuple one, which is X, Y, Z and tuple two, which is one, two, three. So if you do just tuple one plus tuple two, that would give you uh, this one. So it should be just concatenating the uh, two tuples. So uh, for example, let's uh, do this program. Write a Python program to count in a, uh, to, uh, to count in a tuple until an element is a list. For example, we have got this tuple, right? So we have got this entry a high, then we have got entry one, we have got entry zero, then we have got this list. So what the program is asking is until this list comes, count the previous ones. That is count this, count this, count this, and give me the number of these occurrences before we hit a list. So we can initialize the count to zero and then we can iterate over this tuple, right? So for val in X, for val in X, so for each individual entry in the tuple, if is instance, so is instance, what it gives is if that this particular instance is a list or a tuple. So if is instance of this val, if it is a list, then stop, break. If it is not, then count equals to count plus one. So if I run this, it will give you three. So one, two, and three. There are three entries in this tuple before we hit a list. I hope that is clear. So there, uh, there are two, three different functions here. So one is the same iterate, uh, iterating over a tuple, like how we did in a list, right? For val in X, if is instance. So it checks whether this val is a list. If it is so, then stop it here, break. If it is not the case, then increase the count. So once it comes here, it breaks and comes here and prints your count 
which is 3 because i 1 and 0 until we hit a list. Now another uh, small useful function with respect to tuples that uh, you should know is this. So which is say for a list or tuples actually, it applies to both. So for example, you have a list of strings like say apple, orange, banana. So it's one list of three strings. If you want to make one big string out of it, combine all of these things, then this is a standard function. That is this separator dot join map this string to string list. So if you do this, this is what you'll get. So let, let me just first run the program. So it will give you apple hash orange hash banana. That is map is very simple. So it just maps this thing to strings, right? And then what dot join does is it just whatever entries are there in your list, it joins all of them together to calculate to compute one big string. And this hash is your separator. So for example, if I change hash to hyphen, it will give you this apple hyphen orange hyphen banana. Or if you want to just your space here, then it will give you space as a separator here. So it will just create. So if you have three elements, four elements, it doesn't matter. So exactly same way it works with tuples as well. This is another very useful feature. If you want to print certain things in a particular format, so which will come to later. So, so this is a key difference. So you have got lists and tuples. Your lists are mutable, uh, whereas tuples are immutable. Uh, and lists consume slightly more memory compared to tuples. Uh, so that's because of, but tuples are, that's why little faster. Um, so lists have more functionality. So it's not, there is not a lot of significant difference, but it's more like when you have some, when you want some read only properties, uh, when you want, when you don't want uh, any external modification to some of your contents or faster, some of the structures will be faster when you are operating on a very large scale data set, then sometimes tuples are very useful. That's the key difference between lists and tuples. Um, I hope that is clear. So coming to the last two elements of uh, this one, uh, this today's session. So we have got, then we have got two more elements that is sets and dictionary. So set is an unordered collection of distinct elements. So it's unindexed. So that is, you have got the sets, right? It is unindexed. That is, you cannot access the elements of this set using indices, like how you did with a list. Like you can't have here, like uh, animal of zero or like that, you can't access with uh, sets. So instead you have to say, for example, iterate over the sets. For example, for X in animals, print X. So you would get it with this. Another important property of sets is that duplicate members are not allowed inside the sets. So you, you cannot have say two cats. You cannot have say two dogs. So sets have unique members. So this is one important property that you may use in any of your programs. Say for example, you have got a list where you want to sort of find what are the unique entries in the list. So one popular way you could do that is just convert your list to a set so that it automatically becomes a unique entries and then convert it back from a set to a list. So, uh, so you can print like this as well. So print uh, cat in animals. So if you do this, uh, it just prints, say you can see here true and false. That is, it checks whether cat is in, in is a membership operator, like I have said earlier, whether a particular entry is present in that list or set. That's what it checks. So print cat in animals. So if cat is present in animals, it's printing true. Fish is not present in animals. So it prints false. Then if you want to add to the sets, you can use this function that is animals dot add wolf. So then you can write this. So print wolf in animals. Now it prints true. Uh, so animals dot add cats, so adding an element that is already see, for example, here, it, it did not change anything. So because cat is already present, so it did not add one more cat. 
Then remove again, like how you do with the list. So you just do animals dot remove cat. That's one thing. Then you have got uh, discard. So that's another way to remove entries from your set. Uh, works pretty much similar to remove. So animals dot discard wool. So if you print the same thing, uh, it discarded the wool, and you have got dog and tiger. Then joining the sets. So it's pretty much like how you do union of the set. So set one is say cat, dog, and tiger. So set two is parrot, sparrow, and crow. So set three would be set one union of set two. So which is just like how you do uh, set set operations union. Um, then you can also do update. So where instead of doing set one and set two union, you are creating set three. Whereas what set one would do is update your uh, set one dot update set two would actually update your set one with the entries from set two. You are not creating a new set. You are just updating the older set itself. Uh, most of these function functionality, as you can see in the lists or in the sets or in the uh, these things, are pretty much similar, but for key differences. Some do not allow duplicate members like set, and you cannot access them using indices. And then some you can access using indices, but uh, not the other one. So uh, that's so. Let's do a practice program using sets. The question asks: Write a Python program. To find common elements in three given lists, list one, list two, and list three using sets. So as you can see here, list one is given here, right? List one is this. Uh, let's let me just put this in a different cell just so it's clear to understand. So you have got three lists. So which is this? So list one is this. List two is this. List three is this. We just have to find the common elements among all the Three lists. So let's define a function that is common element three lists. The input arguments are list one, list two, and list three. DEF is your keyword, right? So once you receive the list, you are converting all the three lists to sets. So set of list one becomes set one, set of list two becomes set two, and set of list three becomes set three. Once you have set one, set two, set three, so common between all the three, you can also sort of split it as common of one and two and common of one and three. So just like how you had function union here, you also have a function intersection that gives you the intersection between two sets. So set one intersection set two is set one two, then set one two intersection set three is set one two three. Once you have the intersection, then you convert it back to a list. So list of set one two three. So this is a list constructor. So list of something will convert that particular data into a list, just like how you convert it to set here. So list of set one two three will give you list one two three, which you are returning back. So for example, if you run this program, you'll get forty and twenty three. You can see forty is present here, forty is present here, forty is present here, twenty three is present here, twenty three is present here, and twenty three is present. Here. So what you did was just finding common elements to all the three lists by converting each of those lists into sets, and then performing set operations and converting it back to your list. So that is one example of uh, set uh, sets. Then finally, what you have uh, so is dictionaries. So dictionaries are like, like, um, like how is pretty similar to some of like, say like a map object in Java. So where uh, you have two important things known as keys and values. So in, you insert a key and you insert a value in a dictionary using a particular key. Like for example, how you would access in a standard dictionary, like how say uh, this page contains all the English words starting with A, right? So in that case, A would be your key and all those words would be your values. 
say for example all of those words you can put it in a big list where each entry in the list would be a word in that particular page so your dictionary would contain key as a and the value as a list that contains all those words so for example you can create a dictionary like this d equals cat is the key and say it's cute and dog is the key and say it's furry so this is a new dictionary so if you this is uh, so if you say if you print this uh, dictionary if you print it like this so you have got curly braces here the in dictionaries so cat is the key cute is the value dog is the key and furry is the value so you can access the keys and values like this if i write d dot keys print d dot keys that will give me the keys and if i say print d dot values that will give me the values that is cute and furry these are the keys and values in dictionaries so if you want to access the dictionary entries so you have got say for example d of cat print d of cat so which means this is your key right now you should know that dictionaries are unordered as in they won't appear the order in which you uh, insert them so it's not like list whatever order you it's just sort of uh, randomly shuffled there is another thing called as ordered dictionary uh, that appears in collections but we are not going into that so um print d of cat if i do print d of cat it will print cute that is cat is the key so for example again if you want to compare with a standard english dictionary so if you were to sort of print a word that starts with a then print d of a if you do here it would print a big list here that has all the words on that particular page starting with a so print cat in d true because cat is present in that dictionary print d of monkey monkey key is not present so that would produce a error so same thing again then if you want to modify a dictionary say you want to insert a new key so you can simply do this you have got the dictionary d right so d of fish equals wet you are printing an uh, this thing so that would print now your uh, uh, d would look like this that is print of d would be like this now it has got uh, enter fish as well print d dot get uh, get an element with a default prints wet so d dot get fish so that will print wet then del is the keyword again which you can use to delete a particular element so delete this particular delete d of fish so if you do that then it prints not available because fish is not available then d dot pop so if you do d dot pop it pops out that particular value so when you say that particular value so you, you can see here for example d dot pop of cat so which means it will remove uh, it will it will remove the cat as well as the corresponding entry cute as well so this is more like one entry so where you have got key as well as value by using this key you are removing all the value so as in tear away that entire page that contains the words with starting with a so that's the key and you are removing all of the words with that particular uh, key uh, if you want to iterate over a dictionary uh, say you have got d person 2 cat 4 spider 8 say person like two legs four legs eight legs so then if you want to iterate over that so you can print like this for animal in d print uh, so uh, it just prints the keys right person cat spider so if you want to be more precise so so that it prints the keys so if you want to print the values same thing for animal in d print legs d of animal so d of person d of person would be 2 d of cat would be 4 so if you print that it would print the legs you can also iterate like this so for d dot items items will give you both values and keys so for animal comma legs in d dot items so animal will get the key part legs will get the value part of the corresponding key so if i do this it will print person 2 cat 4 and spider 
8. So this again, uh, if cat in D, then print cat is present, else print error. So standard if else, how you would use. Uh, so yeah, same thing again. Um, so you can see here, for example, here, here, I have mistakenly typed it here. This, these two lines are not aligned, are not indented. So because of which you can see here it is red. Now you can see it turns green. So that's sort of how it shows that the indentation uh, does not exist. So if the indentation does not exist, that should pr produce error. Then if you want to copy dictionaries. So for example, you have got a dictionary D, right? Person two, cat four, spider eight. You want to do dict to two equal to D. So you want to create another dictionary, second dictionary. So let's say we do dict two equals to D. So D is our dictionary, dict two is our dictionary. So we have copied, right? Now I'll modify dict two by adding elephant, which has got four legs. So my dict two becomes person two, cat four, spider eight, and elephant four. Let me print my original dictionary D as well. Now, if you see here, original dictionary D is modified as well, right? I actually, what I did was dict two of elephant equals four. But what it has done is it has actually modified the original dictionary D as well. So that is one thing that uh, it's very important to remember that is you can't just simply use the assignment operator equals to to copy one dictionary to another because it always points to your same original dictionary. So instead, let's say D is this, you can use dot copy function. So that is tick to two equals D dot copy. Now, if I copy this and let's do the same thing again. Now I modify dict two, right? Which is this and I print D, it's not modified. So if I use simple assignment operator to copy one dictionary to another, then it does not work because it points to the same original dictionary. This is one way to use the dot copy operator. Then you can also uh, you use this property as well, dict of D. So that is also another way to copy from one dictionary to another. Dict is a constructor, so you can use dict of D as well. So in that case as well, if you modify, it works. So you can see here, I modified dict to, but D is fine. So these are the basic properties of dictionaries, um, keys and values, how you insert a new key, how you, how, get, how you get the corresponding value and things like that. So let's solve a particular uh, practice problem here. Uh, so given a list X, a dictionary Y and a key K. So we are given one list X. We are given a dictionary Y and a key K. Print value of K from the dictionary. If the key K is present in both the list X and the dictionary Y. So if the particular key is present in the dictionary, as well as particular it's present in list, then print its value from the dictionary. So for example, it's very simple. So uh, uh, again, let me make this in a different cell. Uh, so to make it clear. So for example, we have got list X, so which is this. We have got dictionary Y, where key is 11, value is 1000, key is 22, value is 2000, key is 29, value is 3000. Now, K is 11. Now you can see here, right? 11 is present in this as well as this. If that is the case, then my function should return the value that is corresponding to 11, which is 1000. Ultimately, 1000 is the answer that we are looking for because my 11 is present in this dictionary key as well as in this list. So we should get the corresponding value of this key. So let's define a function, find val for key. So X is the list, Y is the dictionary and K is the key. It All it, all it requires is one simple if, fun, if statement with a logical and. So you have got if your key is present in X. That is if your in is again a membership operator, like how I mentioned. So if key K 
is present in list X and so logical and if K key K is present in Y dot keys. So what is Y dot keys here? So for example, if you just take Y, so this is one of the, as you can see, this is one of the advantages of using your Jupyter and also with Python. You can just take your small snippets of program and then just verify them as and when you want. So for example, you have Y here. So if I do print Y dot keys, so that will give me the keys, which is 11, 22 and 29. So, and X is my list. So which is uh, this. So if you, my key is present in X and key is present in list, then return Y of K because Y is my dictionary, Y of this thing. So I run this function and I print this. So it will give me thousand, which is what the question asks. Then let's have another practice uh, pro program. So which is for a given dictionary in Python, write a program to find the sum of all items in the dictionary. So for example, we have got this dictionary, right? A, B, and C. So we want 23 plus 61 plus 99. So, which is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, all you have to do is, uh, so like for example, so we have got this function, right? Sum item, so you're passing the dictionary. So let's define a temporary variable temp sum equals zero. For, particular, for every key in the dictionary, that is for key underscore val in x underscore dip dot keys, temp sum equals temp sum plus x dict of key val. So your dictionary in that particular key value. So you so yeah, it's pretty simple. So you just iterate through all the keys. So for key underscore val in x dot keys. So this loop, for example, will give you if you print these key values will be a, b, and c. So x dict of a is 23 x dict of b is 61, x dict of c is 99. So in a loop, and this you are initializing to zero. So you are just summing it up in a loop that will return you the ultimate sum. So which is 183 and minus 921. So these are some key properties of dictionaries. So what we did here was basically concentrate on four important data structures in Python. You have got the list which is square bracket and modifiable. You have got the tuples, which is parenthesis and not modifiable, it's read only. But pretty much list and tuples are very similar except for these minor differences. Then you have got the sets and dictionaries which do not allow duplicate members. Then you can do the set operations and all. Sets, you can actually think of sets like dictionaries without values, right? So in a dictionary, you have got keys as well as values. Sets, you can think of as just collection of keys. So you, you only have the keys in sets, you don't have the values. Building on top of the sets, you have dictionaries where in addition to the keys, you also have got values. So these are the uh, four sort of uh, important data structures. Um, which we will be using throughout because uh, ultimately this is how like, again, as I said, like, for example, say you are, you are given a uh, table of a data, like some energy monitoring, some data or energy monitoring at a household or a period of time. So you will have like an Excel table. So how do you represent? So for, a, for a, an example, you could represent that in a list of lists, like where you have a big list for one particular household say so one particular area, for example, say one pin code, you have got one big list. And within that list, first list represents house one, second list represents house two, so on and so forth. So that's one example, for example, how you represent like that. So there are different ways. So we, when we expose some bigger data and like examples, so that will be uh, clearer. Uh, there are, of course, different data structures as well, far more efficient data structures, which we'll be discussing in next week. Uh, so I'm stopping here uh, as far as just explaining this is concerned because I don't want to uh, cram too much into this one session. Uh, as you would have received this link for the hacker rank, uh, this thing here. Um, this is the one. So I, I am assuming uh, I am again putting the hacker rank link here, uh, the con contest link. 
So you just join the contest and start with the first pro I can actually, I'll actually display the program here as well. So you can just see those programs and try to write your codes and run it there um, and see how you go. I, of course, we'll do this till the end of the session. So if you have any doubts or anything you can. So um, this is the link, uh, I'm pinging it here in chat. Yeah, so use this link to, okay. Uh, yeah, use this link uh, to join uh, the link that you see here. So once you join the hacker rank uh, contest using this link, so go to the challenges tab. So here, uh, ignore this course and stuff. So first, for example, first open the Python if else challenge. So I'll give you guys some five minutes. Let me know if you can uh, come till this page. Uh, Victor, the link is in the chat. Um, Could you please? I, I know uh, when I put it, put it in the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think. She oh, sorry. Is it like some? I have I have just sent it again. Sorry, I have just sent. No, no, I had to make it panelist and at least here. Sorry, actually, yeah. my, I put it, but uh, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. And now I have put it again. Panelist and attendees.
So I assume uh, you can see. Um, please let us know in the chat if you cannot access this page. It's a pretty simple problem that just entirely rests on just Python if else, just to make sure you get used to it. Uh, <clears throat> So this is, you can actually you can safely ignore these rest of constraints if it makes it more confusing. All the question asks is this, given an integer n, perform the following conditional actions. If n is odd, print weird. If n is even and in the inclusive range of two to five, so two and five are both included, print not weird. If n is even and in the inclusive range of 6 to 20, print weird. If n is even and greater than 20, print not weird. So as you can see here, so if it is odd, then that's it. So you just have got, print, got to print weird. If it is even, then there are three subconditions depending on if it is in the range of 2 to 5, 6 to 20 or greater than 20. So it just says the input format, the constraints are n in the range of 1 to 100. That's fine. You, you, uh, that doesn't matter. So for example, if the input is 0, so if the input is 3, it should be weird because it's odd print weird. So if uh, input is 24, for example, 24 is even and greater than 20. So it should print not weird. So here you should write your program. So this is uh, import statements are another way, uh, are, are a very important way uh, to import libraries in Python, like here import math. So it imports uh, math, libra Python libraries that give you mathematical functions. Uh, so this, uh, import random, uh, random is a library that is very useful if you want to generate random numbers for some of your functions, like a starting point, starting seeds, or random numbers. So some of these things we'll get into later. So you just had to write your functions here. So you can see here, uh, this is another in, uh, interesting sort of nugget. So if, if underscores so name equals main, so what, what is the use of this line? So when you have a big Python project, right? So you would have, you might have two, three Python files so you have one Python file from which you are calling a function in another Python file. So like how I said about say addition. So you, you have one Python file, main file, in which you are inputting numbers, running, displaying, doing something. And you have a main fun function file, which is nothing but takes the arguments, returns your values. So when you have two, three files, whether your particular fi Python file, whether it should execute itself as a main or whether it is being imported by some other Python file. That is decided by this condition. So if name equals to main is whatever file this line appears in, that Python file is executed. It does not work as a module or anything that other file imports. So for this prog program, ignore all of this. So you just come here, right? So you have n. So start with n and all you have to do is do this. So if n is odd, print weird. So as you could see, so if, so one way to uh, check whether uh, n is odd or n is even is through your division by two. So if it is divisible, whether, whether it is divisible by two or whether it is not divisible by two. So we can see the solution here as well. So this, this is pretty much the solution. So for example, if you want, where did I go? Yeah. So this would be your solution. So if n percent two, that is when you divide it by two, if it is not zero, right? If it is not zero, that means your number n is odd. Then print weird because you have one condition here, if n is odd, print weird. 
Then you have got if n is even, you have got three subconditions. So else, so if n is not odd, then the only other thing is you don't have to have another if here because n has to be even. So inside the else, you have three conditions here n in the range of 1 to 6. Now, why have I written 1 to 6? Because you can see here, it says inclusive range of 2 to 5. So if I write here n greater than 2, n less than 5, it's just greater. It's not an equal symbol. If I had used equal symbol, then it would be 2 to 5 greater than or equals 2, less than or equals 5. Then that would be fine. Since I'm just using greater or less symbol, so I'm just sticking to 6. So what 2 to 5 range, not weird then 6 to 20 range weird else print not weird. So that's uh, and then do this. So run the code here to verify your output and then submit the code. So I'll give you a few more minutes uh, if you have any doubts. I'll just check submissions here whether uh, you are able to submit. You all submissions. Okay, that's good. I have four accepted. There are four to five wrong answers because probably that has not worked for one or two conditions. So you you should see at the top uh, there will be test cases. Test cases one, two, three, four, five, six. So like for uh, like for some of the users here, I think it might have failed in some of the test cases. So for example, their score says. It doesn't say perfect and it says 8.33 or 6.67 depending on how many test cases you might have gotten wrong it has to work for different cases different uh, like for example there are three to four conditions right so the test cases would include examples for all those conditions Give it a go. We'll, once we once we finish the session, we'll share the these uh, solutions for this uh, problems. These are publicly available problems on the hacker rank, so it's not any custom problems or anything. So let's move on to the second problem then. So which you would be using there. So it, this is even, even simpler problem. This is a pretty straightforward problem. Um, so it's on just loops. The provided code stub reads an integer n from the standard input. For all non-negative integers i, less than n, print i squared. So for example, if you are given three, then for all i less than n, print i squared. So that would be zero, one, and two, which are less than three. So you have to print zero squared, one squared, two squared. So you have zero, one, and four. So again, you don't have to bother about the constraints here. That is more like they won't be giving any input greater than 20. But if you write a generic program, that should work for pretty much any n. So if you sample input is five, so that would be zero, one, four, nine, sixteen. So your sample input is five. So you'll have from zero to four. So zero squared, one squared, two squared, three squared, and four squared. So same thing here, if name equals mean. So you got the n here from this raw input. So just had to print here. 
this is a pretty simple uh, uh, this one. So just like how this would work. So you just have to there is, you just have to use the uh, function called range. So a range is something like you can see here. Uh, so range of if you just write like this range of say 10 if you write like this it actually creates an object it's called a range object so so you can see here it's a range object if you just write range of 10 that will create a range lower limit is 0 and upper limit is 10 so range of 0 to 10 so if you do this now you can actually use this range to create different types of objects so for example if i do 